why men cheat. Um, and it's a conversation around emotional healing and forgiveness for the family. And this topic has come up because we're watching how in our black families and in the black church and in our black communities that we're seeing truthfully, not only men cheat, but we're seeing where families are being affected by this emotional turmoil that we're sitting in with the 400 year pandemic along with uh, COVID-19. And we wanna talk about what kind of stressors lead to men cheating. Um, what kind of stressors lead to families having these breaks and, and coming apart um, in this season. So I'm gonna turn it over to Coach Deb, let her get started and do her thing. So Coach Deb, it's your go. Thank you so much, Margaret. I'm so glad to be here and I'm happy that this great panel is a part of this conversation that needs to be communicated amongst people because a lot of homes are being torn apart because of a stigma that we want out there as being something unforgivable. You cheat one time, you go home. Well, there's a, a route to the cheating and we're gonna talk about that tonight. So let's go ahead and introduce the panel Margaret, please tell the people who you are and your credentials. I am Margaret Cunley. Can y'all hear, um, hear me? I'm Margaret Cunley. I am a licensed clinical social worker. I also have my Master's of Divinity. And so that's who I am tonight. So I'm here to talk about some of the clinical views of what happens when families there have this thing happen to them. So I um, look forward to having this conversation and moving on through it tonight. Absolutely. Pastor Holly, please share with the people who you are, sir, and what it is that you do. Um, I'm lead pastor of Unity Worship Church, or again, Sebastian Holly. Okay. And you counsel too, don't you, sir? Yeah. Married couples and all. I'm a PhD okay. in counseling. Yes, sir. And, and Cyril, please share with the people who you are, sir, and what it is that you do. Sorry, my mic is muted there. I'm glad to be a part okay. of it. Okay. I'm Cyril White from To God Be The Glory Sports in Houston. And I work with a lot of, of athletes and, and young men. And I definitely um, have witnessed uh, what happens to families uh, when they are, you know, broken up. Witnessed a lot of firsthand incidents with athletes and, and other people. So. This is definitely a good a good topic tonight. I'm glad to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for being here. I'm Coach Deb. I'm an ordained pastor and a spiritual coach. So we're going to talk about uh, this uh, topic that people shy away from. We want to, you know, we gotta we gotta help each other. We it still takes a village. So if we open up a platform where people can just be real about some things that they're feeling, questions that they may have. It's all about us helping one another. That's what it's all about. So first of all, I'm gonna start out with the question. Dr. Margaret, what do you believe is a root cause to why someone would cheat? What is one thing, and that's gonna be the question for all of you. What is one thing that you believe could be the cause the root cause of why someone would cheat. Um, and I'm glad we changed it to someone because I saw men and I'm a woman all day, but women cheat too. And we <laughs> we have discovered that in recent times with women, like Erica yes, Campbell did. came out yes, and just admitted her. She was like, I was the cheater, you know? So, um, but I think the root cause in, in any matter where you have infidelity is the lack of communication um you begin to separate and move apart and nobody wants to speak about anything that's happening so you begin to find spaces of care and comfort and as we are humans and we need human connection you begin to find it in someone else and so it leads to intimacy that leads to sex for some people sometimes you have this emotional connection it may not even be sexual but it's infidelity connected because you are detaching from that which you have committed and walking covenant with so um for me it's always communication like that is a root cause we are not talking we are not speaking and we are not overcoming these hurdles as couples um should you know you 
communication is key to any relationship. We talk about that with Christ. Like we have to pray to God. We have to commit ourselves to Christ in that particular prayer space and conversation with God. And if we don't have it, we miss what God is trying to tell us, right? You have to do that with your, with your partner, with your spouse. It's so, so important. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Holly, what is what what is your answer to the root? One of the reasons uh, that uh, men or women cheat. Uh, if I had to boil it down to just one response, it would be insecurity. Just insecurity, um, especially with men. I think that's a lot of the reason why men um, find themselves, uh, you know, in those struggles is just insecurities uh, that produce selfishness. <laughs> insecurities that produce a need or uh, longing in you that uh, actually you're expecting someone in the flesh to pacify something that needs to be pacified supernaturally or essentially with your own intimacy with God. Okay, um, Cyril, what is one thing that you believe is the root to why men and women cheat? Um, you know, just try to follow in the footsteps of Pastor Holly, just try to sum it up in a word. I would just say selfishness. You know, uh, you know, I he, he said insecurity. That's that's a very good summary. I would also just, just boils down to selfishness. Um putting your you know, personal desires above the new um the new being in which you've morphed into once you're in a committed relationship. I was just counseling with one of my former players the other day. He was one of my players back in 02 and 03. And, you know, he's out working now and uh, talking about some of this stuff, like, like you were saying, Margaret, about the connection, right? You said about the communication and the connection. And I was telling him, look, man, you're not a man anymore. You go from being a man to a husband and from a husband to okay. a father. So you've already morphed into different forms of being from, from a husband and then from a husband to a father. So you have to strip these things off to just go back to being the man that you once were. And you just can't do that. And he was like, yeah. But you know, it's all born out of being selfish and not seeing yourself in those new roles. Gotcha. So now, isn't it fair to say that if a man or a woman is not healed in a certain place in their lives, that one could cheat and be and feel condemned or convicted uh, for doing so. Anybody? The one you said one could do what? One could cheat. One could cheat. Man or woman could cheat due to due to. Let's just say all of what you say is true, but whenever you come to Christ, you know. You 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 feel protected. You feel protected when you come to Christ, and you feel confident that you're going to be able to walk a certain uh, way because you're saved, right? You know, but you know, then, uh, then there comes temptation, right? Now you may be able to you know what you're saying, you're withdraw from the devil, and how he says the devil roams to and fro the earth, right? The devil roams to and fro the earth he's looking he's looking always looking you know and uh just trying to devour and like what jesus told what he told was it peter hey the devil desires to sift you like wheat like you know it's like he's looking for an entry point and we all know the famous story about our beloved king david and bathsheba and all that this guy had going for him david and everything that he had going for himself and how immensely blessed he was. He chose to look on Uriah the Hittite's wife and have his soldier killed so he could take his wife, Bathsheba, Solomon's mama, right? So 
you know, it's a powerful thing, the desire of the flesh. And, you know, it, it, it's something that I think that every Christian person, you know, it says, the Bible tells us we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So at any moment, if we don't have on that full armor, anybody can find itself in that situation. The, what does it say? The, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We got to be full of the spirit. Okay. All right. Then I played the, the, the uh, I played the well, I was like, I'll be sure too. Because the, the temptation piece, I, I was, you know, I'll speak to that too. The temptation piece, if we if we go further back in David's history, it's also this space of attachment. I mean, David had really bad attachment issues. I mean, he had a father who didn't claim him. Um, people don't like to say that or read the text Talk like that. Him. But Talk literally had a father that didn't claim him, you know. So that's, I mean the, the prophet asked. Him. You know, yeah, the, the prophet him. asked him, you know, do you have another son? And he said, yeah. yeah, his initial response, he said, these are all of my sons. Like, no, you had another son outside. So what happens when we when we sit in spaces where we're dealing with people who have attachment issues? That that was a clear sign of an attachment issue, um, because if you can come out of your mouth as the father and say, these are all of my sons and it takes the fact that the oil won't pour then for you to still lie. And then you realize, oh, well, there's one outside. That let us know that David was sitting in the space of being thrown away and disregarded. So what happens when you feel that way in your marriage? What happens when you feel that way when you're not heard? So, A, how, how are human beings attaching? And I'll speak to it. I work with a lot of men. Men, men absolutely need to feel that attachment. If you, they're not being heard and they're not being considered for who they are yeah. and what they bring to the table, they will go find it somewhere else because somebody's going to tell them that they are wonderful, they are handsome, they are everything. And we have to boost. Human beings need that boost. Human beings need to feel appreciated. Right. And that's where those love languages come in. We love to throw that book yeah. around, the five love languages. But truth be told, there are more than five. Like, what does your spouse need from you in order to feel like they have a seat at the table in their marriage? Like for David, David really needed to, at the end of David's life, he realized that I need to be seen and attached. Like I need you to know that I exist. David did a lot of foul things because David didn't feel attached to anything. When he watched his children act like that and it became a generational issue, David slowed down and realized how he needed to attach and get connected. And we see this same thing that flows through, even through Solomon. Solomon had so many wives and concubines but he had a difficult time attaching. So that too, you know, and that's not communicated when it comes down to Christian counseling before marriage. That's I get a lot of people like, it's like nobody ever wants children. to ask the question, you know, do you have any issues from childhood or from young adulthood that might affect this marriage? Most of my couples that right. come right. after in aftermath right. are like, nobody asks us that. And, and I know, I know Dr. Holly asked, because I've talked to him about this before. <laughs> he asked straight up, you know, like. Do you have anything that you're not putting on the table? That's Put right. it all on the table. Right. That, that's prevent that. Right. Yeah. Dr. Holly, tell me, do you think y'all, I know y'all heard about the, uh, the infidelity uh, with uh, Pastor John Gray. And I mentioned his name as an example because he's now getting counseling. Mm -hmm. So, what Margaret, what uh, Margaret has stated, do you think that that's possibly a, an issue with John Gray attachment issues, um, or something he was younger that wasn't dealt with? Absolutely. Um, I'm I'm going to be careful because you know I really try not to um, criticize any other uh, pastor, especially uh, leader. Right, <laughs> but but. Right. I have I have to um, be specific as well, but someone else may actually learn from it. So when you start talking about attachment issues, there's also a root. The root most of the time is rejection and abandonment. Off the top, have rejection and abandonment. Anytime a man hasn't grown up with his father or there are some, are some emotional deficits, deficits there, um, you know, because there was um, a parent not there or what the parent was supposed to add to the dy dynamics of the child's development is missing. Right. Um, if that has never been dealt with, if it has never been addressed, then the vast majority of the times you're going to grow up with these unresolved traumas that produces needs. The reflection of these un unresolved traumas produce certain needs out of balance uh, needs. 
And so you can have an incredible wife at home and still have a need that you're trying to pacify. Again, you see the insecurity that comes as a result of that, because the most of the time when you have rejection issues and abandonment issues, there's also an identity issue. Right. So there's a need that's there that you're trying to pass out, that you're trying to feel a lot of times with uh, with with people who are, uh, are are celebrity celebrity status. So, you know, our minister, uh, uh, Pastor Gray, you know, he's, he's a celebrity minister. Right. Especially over the recent last couple of years and all the different things that he's that he's been through and gone through and all the high, high, uh, high, high real play that he's been getting. <laughs> that becomes its own drug. Right. And so you find yourself trying to pacify a bigger need because now there's a bigger ego that's crazy. You, you, am I making sense? And so this, it's, it's, it's very real. You feel me? And this is another thing that when you have ministry being built and you're, um, you're, you're seizing ministry off of your gifts and talents and not your intimacy with God or not your pursuit with God, then you can find yourself in these dangerous waters very quickly. Cyril, do you believe that before a person, before couples come together as man and wife, that a part of the counseling they should, um, as they put everything on the table, to the questions, the questions that one would ask in counseling be, does your family have mental issues? Did you hear me, Cyril? I think it, it kind of it kind of broke up a little bit. It kind of broke up a little bit. I believe you're asking about counseling, about couples having counseling. Yes, and when when it yes, when it comes yeah, to I mean, it, a it, husband, it, it, yes, a, I definitely believe in that because you know it says in the plan. Uh, Plans fail for lack of counselors, right? But in the multi, in the multitude of counsel, plans succeed. So, so I I think other times, if as you, especially in our community, a lot of times we don't seek out that proper professional counseling. A lot of times, you know, we're, sometimes people are just ashamed to do it. But they can handle everything on their own okay. and feel like, you know, I don't want to have anybody in my business or, you know, just some of the things that don't allow people to open up and communicate these things, put them out on the floor so they can get back on the right and proper track. Um, you know, there are a lot of, just like the people on this panel tonight, you know, a lot of, there are a lot of qualified people that care, that love sincerely that want to give advice just to make the world a place and be nosy and want to judge well a lot of times the people are going through things of the full creation narrative the help that they need okay um uh, uh, I want to apologize for the technical difficulties for those of you that are tuning in. Just bear with us. Uh, some of us are having some uh, uh, some weather issues. But, uh, Margaret, I want to ask, there's no playbook, first of all, comes to mm -hmm. counseling, you know, uh, couples before they're married. You missed the mark because we're a lot of times concerned about the credit score, uh, we're concerned about, uh, you know, if there's any type of physical problems uh, uh, in the in the in the lineage because of, you know, wanting to have children. There's a lot of different things that matter when it comes to going through counseling. And if the man of God or the woman of God that's counseling them or the counselor doesn't bring up certain questions to be asked, then those questions won't be asked and you won't have you won't have the answer. Do you believe that it's up to the counselor to be the one to present that playbook as far as what questions to ask and most definitely regarding, you know, if they got a sexual addiction, um, if they think about being with multiple women, you know, regardless of regardless of the status, 
you know, regardless if you're a Christian or not, all that's put out the way. Because see, I think a lot of times, a lot of things are ignored because certain things are expected of a person and you dare not to ask because you don't want to offend. Well, look at all the families that have been torn apart because ain't nobody being raw and authentic and saying some things that might embarrass them. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So what questions do you think help somebody tonight? What questions do you think ought to be put in place to be a part of that, that prevention? You know, was landed out on the table. You know, because if they let me let me say if they were to uh if they were to be you know uh be with each other before marriage, that's a question that they ask. Have you been together? Have you come, you know, have you uh, uh come together as husband and wife? You know, uh though they ask those questions, you know, why can't they ask, you know, uh if you you battle? with pornography do you battle with you know things that could become a real issue do you like more than one woman in the bed with you do you like me and two you know these questions need to be asked amongst even church so-called church people because it's all coming out now and rather than trying to save the family because of embarrassment it's like oh no you got to go so this is my so this is my belief on that. And this is this is clinical. Um, because I and I mean you can please DM me. You don't come for Coach Deb or Dr. Holly or see <laughs> DM me, but this is my belief. It is not the counselor's responsibility to fix your relationship. Like they can't, they're not in it, they're not there all day. You bring to the table what you can. So I have a really good um uh, colleague, really good friend by the name of Brady Rafford. And I love this technique he does with every couple. And what he does, he says, put it all on the table. That's the name of the technique. And he literally allows this couple to sit in a space of play. <laughs> so play therapy. And they have to put it all on the table. What he means by that is, if you know that you have a problem with monogamy, but you're dating someone who think when you get married that monogamy is going to be the answer, you need to put that on the table. Because this person gets the right to walk away from this engagement. This is premarital counseling because you're not being honest most of the time. So you know you're going to cheat. Like, because I don't know how to be monogamous. It saves time. Like, you know, you have an issue with money. Put it on the table that I don't know how to make a budget because this helps couples see what really needs to happen because marriage seems really pretty when planning. But oh my God, when you get married, like, you now have to live with this person. I personally have this in my office. This is I use three C's in my office. You have covenant, because that's what we love to talk about. When anytime I've married someone, because I'm ordained as well, I, I I counsel them and I tell them, I say, you have these things. You have covenant. That's the one we want to jump on in the church. Like, oh, you got a covenant. This is what it looks like. This is biblical marriage. This is not that. But then in that covenant, pay attention to our covenant with God. You have a commitment. That commitment is where you're sitting in those promises to grow and move together. And all the stuff that you say when you pledge your undying love to someone, right? But then you have a contract when you get married. Now, contracts get revisited. My contracts with my insurance companies get revisited every three years. And if I haven't done what I'm supposed to, guess what happens? They got a right to let me go. And so in that contract, that's where that negotiation of what does what sits. Now, that's what I do with my couples because we don't look at those three C's as important, but that's what keeps relationships healthy. You may find that if you've been together for three years, you may discover a lot about your spouse. Well, you need to go look at the contract. Covenant and commitment for me overrule the contract. Can I be honest? But when it comes down to this, okay. what do we do? That what do we do is really important on how we move because now we're looking at finances. We're looking at how we can live together. We're looking at how we move in this, in this space of oneness. Um, and how we present ourselves. But a lot of couples come in and they only have this gleam in their eye of what they think they want versus talking about what's really going on um, with you. Because you're bringing all of you to the table, the childhood hurt, the, the past relationships, yeah. if you haven't dealt with them, yeah. all of that coming to the table. And it's very vital that we recognize that that is on the table. So until that's discussed, you got a lot of couples that come back and they go see Reverend Holly now because they're sitting in this space. Like John Gray, and I'm not talking about him. I mean, this is just the stuff he's put out. You can go look it all over because I I, don't, I refuse to talk about a pastor negatively like that. I mean, he got a lot of stress on him. 
but he's put this out. Right. He has a lot of childhood stuff he hasn't dealt with. And his wife took on this responsibility of being a rib for him. But he has a lot of childhood stuff. He said out his own mind, I got a lot of childhood stuff I hadn't dealt with. And I really need to go sit with that. So I'm proud of him for seeking counseling and doing that because he wants to save his marriage. So um, and, and hopefully this conversation invites people who have sat in that space to go right. do their work. That's what I invite them to do tonight. Do your work. We, we invite everyone uh, to uh, be a part of this conversation tonight. Uh, we want you to message us. We want you to just, you know, uh, share your thoughts. Uh, this is an open forum. We want you to share your thoughts. Uh, Dr. Holly, I'm interested in knowing um, how important is soul ties, sir? How important are soul ties to um, a man or a woman, uh, you know, falling into infidelity? I want, um, just for the sake of the theological argument, I won't use the term soul ties. I will use the, okay. the, the thought or the idea of emotional ties, emotional ties. Um, a lot of times you, you we don't realize how strong emotional ties can actually be. Um, and we don't realize that these emotional ties are being created in relationships prior to marriage or even in illegal conversations that's taking place while a person is in covenant or in marriage. You know, that's really huge. And they're, they're incredible. They're absolutely incredible. Um, the emotional aspect of, of, of what we do is so heavy from a natural standpoint that you can literally have people that argue within themselves on whether you can have or you can be in love with multiple people or you can be in love with more than one person. You are real talking. A lot of that has to do more with emotionalism or these emotional ties than they actually have to do with truth. You're supposed to be married or in covenant based on truth, based on a a uh, an attachment that God has called you into or God has put you into. But a lot of times the people are in, in marriages based on their emotional needs, uh, which brings up a whole nother level of why this uh, is so strong, because you have people that are trying to uh, get something out of another person, praise God, because of something that's broken within them. And, and that's illegal. <laughs> I mean, just at the highest sense of proper relationship, that does not work. It has no power to work. And so that's that's one of the things that we have to um, we have to consider about the strength of, of emotionalism and emotional ties that you have with individuals. OK, so, Margaret, how is it that um, how how is it that when there are people that are seeking new relationships before they are actually healed from a past relationship, whether it be a divorce or a, uh, you know, a companionship relationship. Why is it that you, that people are seeking new relationships after it, they haven't had time to heal? And a second question connected to that, would that also be a reason why most people fall into infidelity. What well, the go with the first question? Why, why are people seeking new relationships and they're not healed? Right. That, I, I think we just answered it. They're not healed, so they want they want someone. Doctor Holly said it perfectly. You want somebody else to tend to your wounds. Um. Hey, Sierra. <laughs> How you doing? So. Hey. And I actually, I'm going to help, I'm gonna ask Sarah to help me answer this question because I, I actually don't want just right. a female opinion on it. But we jump back into relationships. The question was, Sarah was, you know, why do we jump into relationships and we're not healed? So from a female perspective, we jump into a relationship not healed because we want somebody to help tend to our wounds. Like, I need this human connection. I need, I'm in so much pain. So somebody will come and take care of the pain with me. But because we're not healed, we start to put the burden of the last so relationship like on this human. Second, two behind with everything tonight. It's just oh, is, is it still working? Uh, okay, so we start to put the burden. Maybe, and I hopefully for men, I don't know if this is the same for men. I, I work with men. They say this sometimes, but for the guys on here tonight, you know, for women, 
we end up putting that burden on our companion, like, because we have the recall. So it's like, well, I, when I was with him last time, you know, this is what happened. So I see you doing it. I mean, and we get yeah. really yeah. Um, versus going and doing our work and healing and being able to say to our partner, to, to our spouse or whoever it may be at this time, you know, this is where my pain is. This is where my trauma is. And that was a trigger for me. People think that's so calculated in conversation, but it's not. That was a trigger for me. I do not like that. We teach that to domestic violence victims, but I, I teach it to people who've sat with emotional abuse. Say, that's a trigger for me. I do not like that because your partner won't know unless you tell them. And so that's really vital. Um, and hopefully, or um, well, maybe Holly can can tag yeah, along let me, yeah, let me, let me, with it. Let me jump in uh, just a couple of thoughts of, um, that I got just from what some of the things you're saying. It is very different from men to women. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, I, I can only talk from a biblical right relationship, God perspective. So forgive me. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's not yeah. you know, in any yeah. man's, um, uh, thing. But but the reality of it is for men and women is very different because in the design of God, a man is literally made in the relationship to give love so that women can reciprocate love. You know, that's important. Um, the love that he gives to the woman is supposed to help her to heal. Uh, the other key is that he has to give the love that he has received from God. You know, it is a supernatural thing. So um, from the standpoint of healing, from the standpoint of having emotional needs, women can come to the table with an expectation for someone to help them heal um, to a degree based on these principles. The other uh, PowerPoint uh, that, that we talk about, and I don't want to just beat um, a dead drum, so to speak, but one of the things that we have to remember is a lot of stuff is not being dealt with on the front end in premarital counseling. We leave a lot of stuff dangling. We lie about stuff. We, you know what I mean? And it's not just about uh, all of the information becoming available in the relationship as much yes. as it is about the individuals that's going into relationship yes. actually yes. healing. You know what I'm saying? Healing. That, that's the big key because when you come into a relationship and you're broken, praise God, then your expectations for the other person are totally unfair. You know, and that's a really big yes, thing sir. to have to deal with. Um, and there is healing available in the release of the of, of the hurt, in the release of, of the bondage. There is healing available. Um, one last thing. Most people get married for the wrong reason. Mm. Their uh, expectations uh, of marriage are totally wrong. And I'm talking about believers. Let me just deal with, with quote, unquote. Yes. Issues. And y'all know I don't generally use that word yes. for the sake of people's understanding. I say that. But, but. A lot of believers literally get married for the wrong reason. They get married to be happy, you know, and that's not God's priority for marriage. You know what I'm saying? Happy is a consequence. It is not a priority. And that, and, and because of that, we, 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 we have the, because we have the wrong expectation, right? Then we are, the how we choose is wrong. See, if I get married and want to be happy, then I'm somebody that's good looking. You know, if I get married because I want to be happy, then I want somebody with money. If I get married because I want to be happy, then I want somebody with good job and benefits. I mean, you know, I mean, honestly, uh, and, and, and sometimes none of these things may be available for who God has for you. He has an expectation Absolutely. for you guys to build and grow together uh, as such. And again, you know, and a lot of times if you're, you know, while you're in the process of preparing for covenant relationship or marriage, praise God. Asking these questions become valuable, but at the same time, you can't weigh your decision based on your own selfishness. You have to weigh your decision on what God is or, or leading you to do or who God may be leading you to be with. At what point do you, at what point do you put up on the relationship because of the cheating? That that's a hard one, Coach Deb, um, because people really have to know what they can take, um, and that's why premarital counseling. That's why okay. because that's why premarital counseling is vital because you learn that's the that. Prevent that's the preventive. You it's right there at the table. So you know, uh, uh, Doctor Hollis said Christian marriage. Uh, because I work with all marriages, everything he just said applies to all of them. So. 
when you come in, I, I literally had a couple in my office decide not to because we had to put it all on the table. And the first thing they said was, we make each other happy. So my next question back was, well, what makes you sad? Because eventually they're not going to be able yeah. to that because if they make you happy no one should be able to make you happy happiness comes because happiness comes because we choose it and happiness comes as a consequence of our actions for our emotional wellness and so if this person isn't making you happy guess what they're going to end up doing letting you down they're going to make you sad so what makes you sad once we start going through that we start walking through values and principles and if you don't line up with values and principles with and, it, and we can't come into alignment and understand what that equal yokeness is. And a lot of people want to say, well, we equally yoke. Now, equal yoke is, is talking about a agricultural term. That both of those oxen have to have similar weight, similar stance, so that it doesn't mess up the row when the plow is going through, which means if we can't see eye to eye on where we're going, we don't have to have the same job. We don't have to have the same loves and favorite movies. None of that, which is what couples think equal yoke means. No, no, no. Equal yoke means can you see me moving forward and can I see you moving forward too? And we're growing this relationship. And for me, for who I am, are we growing this relationship to where we're going to be a light unto the earth and to other spaces? What, what are we doing? Because if that's not the case, then we're going to bring harm to ourselves and to others. And we may not need to walk into a marriage or a covenant relationship like that. We, we can't. So that's when you, so when you ask the question, how, how long do you let it go? You have to remember the principles that you live by. If you're a Christian, you have already decided in, the, so in a choosing bed, you can leave or you can stay. But you are, if, if you're going to stay, then you can't force anybody to do anything. You have to pray for them. That's what it says in Corinthians. You got to pray. So, right. what, what are you going to do? How right. long do you see somebody cheat? Are they putting you at risk? Was this a one time moment? That's when you need to speak with someone who's professionally trained. I'm going to keep saying it to understand where right. you're sitting. Right. And then we're sitting in spaces of judgment. Sometimes we go to the wrong space. Right. We go to our sister or our brother who be like, well, <laughs> no, no, no. You don't need a well. You need you need somebody to say, what is the issue? And is this worth, is the love you have for this space worth fighting for? If that answer can't be, then that's when you determine what does it look like for us to move on and realign and refocus this relationship? Because we might have gotten married for the wrong reason. Wow, she just um, just really said she one of the key elements that I uh, that I start from. Oh, yes, yeah, she definitely covered the basis uh, that I always start yes. start from um, is is the wealth of the marriage. You have to weigh the wealth of the wealth of the marriage. Um, you know, give you two stories Absolutely. and one situation like that, a company. Uh, not a company, a couple. <laughs> I'm so tired, y'all. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, <laughs> a couple was uh, was coming to me literally, uh, and they called each other the same last name. They they lived together. Um, I mean, my God, I just I mean, and I literally have been trying to counsel them for like a few months, and then it came out that they actually wasn't even married. You feel me? And <laughs> you know, and they had been together for years, but they weren't really married. You know what I'm saying? And as a result of that, I told him, I said, you guys are trying to get covenant promises, but you're using, you're using carnal principles. On, you know, and, and that's real. That is so real. So when you start thinking about weighing a relationship or weighing the marriage, praise God, it's not even of real value until you're actually in a covenant relationship. And that has to be by God. You feel me? That has to be. Come on. Us coming together with the expectation of God doing supernatural or working supernatural through our agreement. You feel me? That's the that is the real expectation. Um, you feel me? The second story. You think about. I've seen a situation where uh, a couple was just in in shambles, uh, uh, but they they were they were not married. They were just in shambles, and uh, and I got a chance to talk to the to the uh, to the brother the the. Uh, the young man and I told him, I says, man, there are so many promises associated with marriages that if you truly walk fully in those things and the things of God, man, you'll see God just pour. He'll just rain in your marriage like you would not believe. You don't have to keep playing this this game, make up, break up, uh, he cheat, she cheat, all this. You don't have to play that game, man. If you love her, go ahead Come and believe her and marry her. Um, you feel me? And, uh, and, and, and honestly, less than a month, they, uh, he had a, 
proposed in another month or so. They actually had got married the year to follow. Just like I told him, God reigned. They went from renting a house to purchasing a house. He went from working for somebody else to starting a business and that business just exploded. Went from little raggedy cars breaking down all the time to actually buying newer vehicles. And I mean, and, and from then to now, that's just a very prosperous relationship. If you feel me, and all that was held up was his movement in God. You know, so one of the things that I, I be, I, I'm always encouraging people to do when you try to when you're trying to decide whether to stay or leave, the first thing you want to do is weigh the value of the marriage. If God has promises for this marriage, uh, promises for this couple, you don't want to just run away because the world tells you should be hurt. Did you hear what I said? Because the world tells you you should be hurt. Because a lot of that's what people are, are weighing it on. That's what they're basing on because the world says I should be embarrassed. The world say I should uh, I should run away or I should leave this. You know, really, and it's all selfishness. It's all very personal. Praise God. Um, and, and it may just be that the enemy is trying to destroy it before it get off the ground. And you may need to make take the high ground and say, you know what? I'm not going to let this destroy my marriage. We're going to fight through this and we're going to work through this and get to the promises or get to the destiny that God always had for us. On the flip side, I've seen situations and I'm and, and y'all may not expect for no pastor to say this, but I told her, leave him. He ain't gonna change. He's gonna keep doing the exact same thing. He has no intentions. You know, you, you feel me? You might have missed out on this. Honey. Hmm? Somebody gotta speak wisdom, Dr. Holly. I'm with you. <laughs> that's that's wisdom. And I, yeah. I I literally just had a couple, I just had a couple to come through my office and I kept sitting here because, and on the clinical side, I can't look at you and say, Pastor Holly got, he got so much leverage. Let me tell you why, because he's a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> with these credentials, I can't look at you and be like, girl, you better leave him. I mean, because I want to, right, like, right. let me help you. Let me help you. Right. Um, but that's, that's when people have to actualize. So what I do, I literally use Mas, Abraham Maslow's principle of hierarchy needs with my couple. That's right. And I have a couple from the beginning, I saw it. This brother really was like, she's beautiful. She's wonderful. She makes me look amazing. He came in with that sentence. And I asked, I said, did you hear his sentence? And she was like, yeah, I'm beautiful and wonderful. I said, did you hear the last part? He, she makes me look amazing. In other words, he, he didn't compliment you at all. He, you, you, you know. And so she was like, he was like, well, well, now nah, I mean, you know, she beautiful. She wonderful. I said, what else do you see with her? Because if you're only marrying her for her beauty and wonderment, that's going to fade. Y'all are going to get old. She's not going to look like she is 20 years from now. And he had to sit there and ponder it. Because for yeah. him, in the in the line of work he did, he needed someone to be beautiful and wonderful because he needed some arm candy. So I just <laughs> let her ask the question, are you ready to get married or do you need a girlfriend that's beautiful and wonderful? Right. They came back the next week and they had to process it because he said, well, what really goes along with marriage? Because everybody's telling me to marry her because she's a good catch. He said, truthfully, I don't know what that means, Margaret. And I said, oh, I said, we got a lot of work to do. At the end, yep. they decided this wasn't it. Because for him, he really just wanted some arm candy. He wanted to be seen in public with somebody beautiful and wonderful so he could look good. So he could get his next gig. It, it didn't have anything to do with a commitment inside this covenant nothing it was just I, I need this piece so they both decided and they were able to rectify a friendship because she was like i'm so glad we didn't go as far as to say i do because for me marriage is children settling down i personally don't like his job because i don't like being arm candy so i, I said so you're going to end up asking him to leave the job she was like well <laughs> i mean i i want him to be settled that was wrong on both ends so you really have to be prepared, you know, when you do this. Ma marriage is not just fun and games and a dress and a suit. I mean, oh, my God, it, it's not. It's really building life together in the eyes of God. That's how I see it. But it's building life together. And, and for those not on this, the, the Christianity end, but it really still is building life together in this oneness space. You are no longer moving separate. You really have to negotiate and talk with your spouse about your movement. And healing comes from that. And if you don't have it, then it's going to mess up everything in that relationship, in my opinion. Well, clearly, based off of what Dr. Holly stated, God don't bless no mess. When these people lined up, when they got an alignment, with what God says to do, that's when blessings begin to flow. 
and you know, I he sort of answered my question regarding uh how long you stay, what do you do? Because when it comes to domestic violence, when it comes to incest, when it comes to different things in a relationship, knowing the heart of the person, uh, whether or not they're sincere, when it comes to forgiveness and things of such, I love that pretty much you put it out there, uh, you know, seeking God, seeking God on instruction, you know, when it comes to the saving of a relationship and wrong is wrong and right is right. So I'm wondering too, should in the counseling portion of the prevention, uh, should knowing what is in their lineage as far as jational stuff be a part of the question when it comes to moving forward in the relationship? So you know what to expect regarding, you know, the the perversion uh, mm -hmm. and abuse. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it's like we ask questions about what religion are you? What do you believe? Are you atheist? Are you Muslim? It's like we ask that question. And I think the reason why we do that is because that's something that's on the forefront, you know, you know, religion. But we're not answering the questions that could really uh, cut your legs off in a, in a marriage when I, it comes I, to what's in your lineage. I think, what's in your well, lineage? I think Pastor Sean Jones, I love her. Hello. Pastor John Jones, um, she I got the question up because she asked it, and I think that's going to answer a lot of what oh, you. Yeah, that's a good said. question. That's a deep question, but it's it's exactly yeah, what yeah. Just asked. <laughs> So, uh, uh, Holly, I can't do this with by myself. You directed it. Oh no, I mean the answer, <laughs> the response is still the same. You know, someone actually seeking their own deliverance because most time people have these jealousies because of their own personal insecurities. Uh, it, okay. it really has doesn't have a lot to do with the other individual uh, per se. And then if you think about someone actually uh, committing adultery, um, so to speak, and you're trying to find whether you can forgive them or not, going back to the origin of how it took place or why it, it, it took place. Um, so say, for instance, I've, say, I've seen situations where the one person who was cheated on was so angry, not necessarily at the root of it because the other person cheated, is because they realized it was actually a part of their own fault. You know what I'm saying? They had they had fell off in so many okay. areas and they and, and so they had an expectation of this happening. When it did happening, then their response was such anger, but they was really more deeply angry at themselves, right? And and, and, and let me retract real quick. It's always the other, the person who has cheated. It's always their responsibility, right? So when we talk about the blame or the fault or whatever like that, we're only talking about what has primped or, or prepped something that already did exist. You, you, am I making sense? Um, are you there with me? So when you start talking about the jealousy that may exist in a person, then they also have to go back and still deal with themselves and see what's actually broken in this as far as their uh, inadequacies, insecurities, you know, and whatever else that they may be wrestling with. You follow me? Yes, I know right. I do. So, and right. I, and I followed you when you said it, and I and I heard the clarity, right. and I love how he came back because I've I've had couples like that to come in. You know, and a lot. I mean, I've I've had men to come in who've been cheated on, and they wanted to take on the blame of the action. And I said, no, she decided to do what she wanted to do. That's on her, because that could have been communicated. But again, that that harm, that 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 emotion that was harmful to them, um, whether it was anger or sadness or that that moment of rejection again, they had to sit through that because they realized when we got married, I didn't process it, um, and I didn't process what it was, and so we had we I sat with men and they had to process what was the first time they felt rejection, and a lot of them are saying in my childhood by my mom, or in my childhood by whoever that figure was, and so when she did it. Uh, it just it blew up, you know, and it got big. And so and, and a lot of and a lot of people, period, will take on the blame because, again, it's something they have not dealt with. It was my fault. No, it, that the action was on them. But let's work through this thing that's got you stuck because you get stuck in your rut and in your circle until you deal with that space that's eating you alive. These, these are where the, I know Cyril, um, he mentioned the temptations of Jesus. Jesus understood he didn't get stuck in the rest of the temptation. Why? Because he was able to secure. Yeah, that's possible. But I got this. When you deal with that emotionally, yeah, that, that's a possibility. That possibly could happen again. 
But no, I'm sitting in this space of healing. So I know myself, I know my value and nor am I going to step into a place to continue the cycle of pain because I'm calling it out. So there's where that even in jealousy past the shine, like if, if you're jealous of me, then what is it inside of you that needs healing and that has not been adequately fed that, that you're jealous because we're in a relationship. So we should be growing together. That's the equal yokeness. What have you not dealt with so that you walk in the totality of your own strength and you bring it to the table? Well, what is it? What's going on? And that that's how I would, would come to that because that's how you can fix it if, if you can. That's how you would fix that. Let, and let me also add this to the, uh, to the point of the question uh, because the question was absolutely awesome. Uh, and in, 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 in the jealousy will absolutely cripple the flow of God's agreement because that's where the prosperity comes from. That's where the, the that's the wealth of the marriage. That is the benefits of the marriage. Right. Right. So I guess so we don't run out of time. No, <laughs> no I, I can hear you. OK, I see you. There's a noise in the background. I don't know where it's coming from. Can you hear me? I got some work okay. being done. I'm okay, sorry. great. Can you hear me? Can can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. I can hear you. Okay, great. All right. So yeah. tell, tell me. <laughs> Are you there? Okay. I now, now my question. My my question is this. Um, what is it that one should do once you are in a relate, once you, you're married and a lot of things are unveiled, you know, things really, some real raw things are unveiled. You find out that, um, your husband or your wife is still a, attached to a previous relationship. And, um, they just didn't feel, feel like it was important to share that information with you. Or they had a woman that you know the the wife has had a hysterectomy, and or the husband has had you know uh, himself fixed, and they didn't talk about children. What? How do you? How do you resolve? You know that situation with a couple in counseling when they're both sharing some really depth stuff that should have been a part of the prevention counseling, but they're married now. They're believers, and one wants children, one doesn't want children. This is a this could be a reason why they go out and you know get into another relationship. I'm very familiar with two couples that experience that. So how would you how how would you resolve that? Would you recommend that someone else have the kid for them? Would you recommend if they stay together on on uh, on all the relationship? What what did you recommend? This is a real this is a real question. So I and you know I answer from I answer from this standpoint. You know if again I'm going to put it out there and I'm pretty sure Pastor Holly will put it out there too. Free marital counseling, please. If you if you contemplate getting married, please go see a counselor before you do to but prevent this. Because it's a real not, question, and so yes, and I wish we had, had you cut in and out, in and out. Oh Jesus, we don't hear thing. Creep the answer because uh -oh. I know no, I, I do not because uh oh. I'm gonna, she don't know it. But put it all on the table. Y'all bear with us. It's technical difficulties. Uh, Dr. Hall, I would hate you to. Uh, for you to step in while she's trying to explain. Can it's you been hear me? incredible. Yes, ma'am, I can hear you. Dr. Okay, Margaret is still frozen. 
and we right. can't hear things. Just... Okay, you already messaged you. Okay. That's rough, man. It's been a right. whole lot of technical so, difficulties today. Yeah, yes, it has. Uh, to answer that question from a pastor side, uh, mm -hmm. how would you deal with I know that it's the council council, they need to do counseling. I know that, but see, guess what? We live in the real world. Well, people are not doing that. They're being antsy and angels and they're jumping into relationships. They're not courting anymore. None of that. They're not getting to know the person that they want to spend the rest of their lives with. These are very, very realistic questions. And that's why mm -hmm. the rate of divorce is so high, even in the church. Right. How do you save a family? How do you save a marriage with this type of stuff happening? Well, I think one of the things from a from a spiritual perspective that I that I've encouraged in situations very similar is to, to prioritize toward God. You know, I know that this may be an empty place, maybe something that you envisioned, you dreamed, you wanted. Uh, it was important to you. But again, prioritize toward God. Always try to seek to see what God is doing in a, in a particular moment and what his expectations are um, is really uh, the real clear argument. When you start talking about the underlining stuff that's going on with the two individuals uh and we use your same example the baby may represent something else that's that's deeper that's broken within uh the marriage that you can begin to you know see and help them to get around you follow me and then adoption is an option um you know and then just like you you talked about uh and just like you talked about um you know, uh, artificial assimilate, uh, assimilation, all these other type of um, things may become an option once they're freer, you know, to not to play the blame game, not to be at yeah. together, and both really actually are prioritizing toward God. Right. I totally agree. That was a great answer. That was a great answer. Because, because most of the time we don't realize how much is actually broken, how much is actually off. And you can't see that until you start prioritizing toward God. Right, right. It makes so much sense too, Dr. Holly, you know, that we don't jump to uh, the wrong conclusions, that we don't just spaz out and just, you know, act out. But when you can just calm down, have a conversation, talk to the right people, if you really want the commitment, if you really want to stay in the relationship, you know, then it's like you have to find ways to work it out. And I think forgiveness plays a huge role in keeping relationships together. I think. Did you hear what I said? No, ma'am. I'm sorry. Hello? I, I, was I can saying, hear you. I, 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 okay. I will state in that Forgiveness play a huge role in keeping uh, your family together, you know, and reaching out to other ways to, uh, you know, um, strengthen your relationship. I love yes, your answer that you gave. Yes, and I, I, I do believe at the end of the day, forgiveness is the key to move forward. Huge key. We're going to get ready to um, close up uh the conversation but before we do we've lost two of our panels because of technical difficulties and i'm afraid if we don't hurry up and get off it's going to happen to us too close us out with um three things that you believe is a is a must when it comes to uh matrimony when it comes to uh couples coming together uh you, you know give us three things that we need to be attentive to you know before you say and i do uh premarital counseling is 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 literally a must um there's so much with the rose colored glasses that we miss that we don't see when you're in love and and, and especially if, if a couple has already been sexually intimate uh you're in love those things cloud your judgment it clouds your um your sight honestly um and so you really need premarital counseling for someone who's not with the Google eyes and the rose colored glasses, you know, they're not lost in love just like you are. Uh, so they can be an unbiased perspective to help you see clearly things that you may ignore otherwise. Uh, number two is let God pick, you know, let God choose for you. Even in your preparation for marriage, don't be thinking of all of these natural things and these 
people in their list of you need to do this to be properly prepared for marriage and all this. No, really prioritize toward God so that you can have a, a, le a lens to hear what um, who, who he has for you and what he has for you. Uh, that's really important. And then number three, know that God's priority for marriage is not just your happiness. He wants you to be happiness. That's happy. That's not a problem. But if you're only looking for happiness, that can be very circumstantial. And you will find that circumstances change. They shift, you know, your feelings and your emotions being wrapped up into a thing aren't substantial to keep a thing. You have to, you know, choose and make choices based on truth uh, and wisdom that comes from that truth. And so those become really valuable, you know, to the bigger picture of, of marriage outside of our natural, um, you know, attitudes towards it. Well, I tell you, those three things are prevalent. They're very important. I just appreciate so much uh, you sharing. And I, I pray that you were heard. You was heard tonight. I want to thank everyone for tuning in to I'm Not Okay Why. Uh, Dr. Margaret and, of course, Cyril, uh, techni uh, technical difficulties knocked them out. But, of course, we want you to uh, repost the replay uh, as many times as possible because there's a giveaway uh, that's going to be announced tomorrow at 6 p.m. She's back. Uh, Dr. Margaret, I'll get ready to close out. So I need for you to go ahead. Dr. Holly gave us three reason, reasons. Uh, uh, that everyone would need to consider as far as their wise, uh, in you know, uh, knowing before they get into matrimony, and of, of course, you give us three, and then we're going to close out. Give us three reasons, uh, three things that people need to consider, uh, before uh, you know, saying I do. Hello, Dr. Margaret. Hello, hello. I don't think she can hear me and I can't hear her. So we're going to go ahead and close out. Bless her heart. We're going to go ahead and close out. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to uh, Dr. Margaret. Are you there? <laughs> I am. Yeah. Uh, I decided to cut me off, but y'all, I got to keep going. So that's good. You're, break, you're breaking like, up. I was, I was the host. So that's what you just need to be heard. Uh oh. I'm sorry. Oh, boy. My three reasons. First, the determining. So sometimes we hear that word, it sounds good. Can y'all hear me now? You can? Okay. So reason reason one for me is determine if you want to be be married. That means you need to be in marriage. See, both parties because that And the third thing I would say is write down what it looks like to sit in that space of covenant, commitment, and contract. What does it look like to be in this marriage that have defined for one another? Does it children? Does, does it include does it not? Does it include owning a business? But do that together. Write the vision and make it plain. And other, and you do that by planning it out and walking it out. Okay. Well, we're gonna close okay. out. Um, Dr. Holly's already gone. I don't know if it was technical reasons or what. You were breaking up a lot. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Dr. Margaret, Dr. Margaret, can you hear me? Dr. Margaret, can you hear me? Dr. Margaret, can you hear me? Hello? Okay. Get to the kids and type in the reasons. Yeah, I think we're going to.
Yeah, we're going to send the reasons to you guys and we're going to put them on the relationship lounge so that you will have them. The reasons why you should get right. married. I think that was the request. Right. So I think that'll be. Right. We're going to close <laughs> out. Thank you everyone for tuning in to Relationship Lounge. Um, I'm not okay. Why? And to repost the replay for the giveaway. And good night. <laughs>